Chapter 18 133 Hence it follows that the evil having lasted long, the good must be now nigh at hand, so thou must not distress thyself at the misfortunes which happen to me, since thou hast no share in them. How have I not, replied Sancho, was he whom they blanketed yesterday perchance any other than my father's son? And the alforwas that are missing to minus day with all my treasures, did they belong to any other but myself? What? Are the alforwas missing, Sancho, said Don Quixote. Yes, they are missing, answered Sancho. In that case we have nothing to eat to minus day, replied Don Quixote. It would be so, answered Sancho, if there were none of the herbs your worship says you know in these meadows, those with which knights minus errant is unlucky, as your worship are wont to supply such minus-like shortcomings. For all that, answered Don Quixote, I would rather have just now a quarter of bread, or a loaf and a couple of pilchards' heads, than all the herbs described by Dioscorides, even with Dr. Laguna's notes. Nevertheless, Sancho the Good, mount thy beast and come along with me, for God, who provides for all things, will not fail us, more especially when we are so active in his service as we are, since he fails not the midges of the air, nor the grubs of the earth, nor the tadpoles of the water, and is so merciful that he mocketh his son to rise on the good and on the evil, and sendeth rain on the unjust and on the just. Your worship would make a better preacher than Knight Minus Errant, said Sancho. Knights Minus Errant knew and ought to know everything, Sancho, said Don Quixote, for there were Knights Minus Errant in former times as well qualified to deliver a sermon or discourse in the middle of an encampment, as if they had graduated in the University of Paris, whereby we may see that the lance has never blunted the pen, nor the pen the lance. Well, be it as your worship says, replied Sancho. Let us be off now and find some place of shelter for the night, and God grant it may be somewhere where there are no blankets, nor blanketeers, nor phantoms, nor enchanted moors, for if there are, may the devil take the whole concern. Ask that of God, my son, said Don Quixote, and do thou lead on where thou wilt, for this time, I leave our lodging to thy choice, but reach me here thy hand, and feel with thy finger, and find out how many of my teeth and grinders are missing from this right side of the upper jaw, for it is there I feel the pain. Don Quixote Chapter 18 134 Sancho put in his fingers and feeling about asked him, How many grinders used your worship have on this side? Four, replied Don Quixote, besides the back minus tooth, all whole and quite sound. Mind what you are saying, senor. I say four, if not five, answered Don Quixote, for never in my life have I had tooth or grinder drawn nor has any fallen out or been destroyed by any decay or room. Well then, said Sancho, in this lower side your worship has no more than two grinders and a half, and in the upper neither a half nor any at all, for it is all as smooth as the palm of my hand. Luckless that I am, said Don Quixote, hearing the sad news his squire gave him, I had rather they despoiled me of an arm, so it were not the sword minus arm. For I tell thee, Sancho, a mouth without teeth is like a mill without a millstone, and a tooth is much more to be prized than a diamond, but we who profess the austere order of chivalry are liable to all this. Mount, friend, and lead the way, and I will follow thee at whatever pace thou wilt. Sancho did as he bade him, and proceeded in the direction in which he thought he might find refuge without quitting the high road, which was there very much frequented. As they went along then, at a slow pace minus for the pain in Don Quixote's jaws kept him uneasy, and ill minus disposed for speed minus Sancho thought it well to amuse and divert him by talk of some kind, and among the things he said to him was that which will be told in the following chapter. Don Quixote Chapter 18 135 Chapter 19 Oeth the shrewd discourse which Sancho held with his master, and of the adventure that befell him with a dead body, together with other notable occurrences. It seems to me, senor, that all these mishaps that have befallen us of late have been without any doubt a punishment for the offense committed by your worship against the order of chivalry and not keeping the oath you made not to eat bread off a tablecloth or embrace the queen, and all the rest of it that your worship swore to observe until you had taken that helmet of Melandrinos, or whatever the more is called, for I do not very well remember. Thou art very right, Sancho, said Don Quixote, but to tell the truth, it had escaped my memory, and likewise thou mayest rely upon it that the affair of the blanket happened to thee because of thy fault in not reminding me of it in time, but I will make amends, for there are ways of compounding for everything in the order of chivalry. Why? 
Have I taken an oath of some sort? Then said Sancho. It makes no matter that thou hast not taken an oath, said Don Quixote, suffice it that I see thou art not quite clear of complicity, and whether or no, it will not be ill done to provide ourselves with a remedy. In that case, said Sancho, mind that your worship does not forget this as you did the oath, perhaps the phantoms may take it into their heads to amuse themselves once more with me, or even with your worship if they see you so obstinate. While engaged in this and other talk, night overtook them on the road before they had reached or discovered any place of shelter, and what made it still worse was that they were dying of hunger, for with the loss of the Alforwas they had lost their entire larder and commissariat, and to complete the misfortune they met with an adventure which without any invention had really the appearance of one. It so happened that the night closed in somewhat darkly, but for all that they pushed on, Sancho feeling sure that as the road was the king's highway they might reasonably expect to find some in within a league or two. Going along then, in this way, the night dark, the squire hungry, the master sharp minus set, they saw coming towards them on the road they were traveling a great number of lights which looked exactly like stars in motion. Sancho was taken aback at the sight of them, nor did Don Quixote. Altogether relished them, the one pulled up his ass by the halter, the other is hacked by the bridle, and they stood still, watching anxiously to see what all this would turn out to be, and Don Quixote Chapter 19136 Found that the lights were approaching them, and the nearer they came the greater they seemed, at which spectacle Sancho began to shake like a man dosed with mercury, and Don Quixote's hair stood on end, he however, plucking up spirit a little, said. This, no doubt, Sancho, will be a most mighty and perilous adventure, in which it will be needful for me to put forth all my valor and resolution. Unlucky me, answered Sancho, if this adventure happens to be one of phantoms, as I am beginning to think it is, where shall I find the ribs to bear it? Be they phantoms ever so much, said Don Quixote, I will not permit them to touch a thread of thy garments, for if they played tricks with thee the time before, it was because I was unable to leap the walls of the yard, but now we are on a wide plain, where I shall be able to wield my sword as I please. And if they enchant and cripple you as they did the last time, said Sancho, what difference will it make being on the open plain or not? For all that, replied Don Quixote, I entreat thee, Sancho, to keep a good heart, for experience will tell thee what mine is. I will. Please God. God, answered Sancho, and the two retiring to one side of the road set themselves to observe closely what all these moving lights might be, and very soon afterwards they made out some twenty encomacedos, all on horseback, with lighted torches in their hands, the ominous inspiring aspect of whom completely extinguished the courage of Sancho, who began to chatter with his teeth like one in the cold fit of an ague, and his heart sank and his teeth chattered still more when they perceived distinctly that behind them there came a litter covered over with black and followed by six more mounted figures in mourning down to the very feet of their mules minus for they could perceive plainly they were not horses by the easy pace at which they went. And as the encomacedos came along they muttered to themselves in a low plaintive tone. This strange spectacle at such an hour and in such a solitary place was quite enough to strike terror into Sancho's heart and even into his. Masters, and, save in Don Quixote's case, did so, for all Sancho's resolution had now broken. Down. It was just the opposite with his master, whose imagination immediately conjured up all this to him vividly as one of the adventures of his books. He took it into his head that the litter was a beer on which was born some sorely wounded or slain knight to avenge him was a task reserved for him alone, and without any further reasoning he laid his lance in rest, fixed himself firmly in his saddle, and with gallant spirit and bearing took up his position in the middle of the road where the encomacedos must of necessity pass, and as soon as he saw them near at hand he raised his voice and said, Don Quixote Chapter 19
Teen 137. Knights, or whosoever ye may be, and render me account of who ye are, whence ye come, where ye go, what it is ye carry upon that beer, for to judge by appearances, either ye have done some wrong, or some wrong has been done to you, and it is fitting and necessary that I should know, either that I may chastise you for the evil ye have done, or else that I may avenge you for the injury that has been inflicted upon you. We are in haste, answered one of the incomisados, and the inn is far off and we cannot stop to render you such an account as you demand, and spurring his mule he moved on. Don Quixote was mightily provoked by this answer, and seizing the mule by the bridle he said, Halt, and be more mannerly, and render an account of what I have asked of you, else, take my defiance to combat, all of you. Beetle was shot by, and was so frightened at her bridle being seized that rearing up she flung her rider to the ground over her haunches. An attendant who was on foot, seeing the encomisado fall, began to abuse Don Quixote, who now moved to anger, without any more ado, laying his lance in rest charged one of the men in mourning and brought him badly wounded to the ground, and as he wheeled round upon the others the agility with which he attacked and routed them was a sight to see, for it seemed just as if wings had that instant grown upon Rocinante, so lightly and proudly did he bear himself. The encomisados were all timid folk and unarmed, so they speedily made their escape from the fray and set off at a run across the plain with their lighted torches, looking exactly like maskers running on some gala or festival night. The mourners too, enveloped and swathed in their skirts and gowns, were unable to bestir themselves, and so with entire safety to himself Don Quixote. Belabored them all and drove them off against their will, for they all thought it was no man. But a devil from hell come to carry away the dead body they had in the litter. Sancho beheld all this in astonishment at the intrepidity of his lord, and said to himself, Clearly this master of mine is as bold and valiant as he says he is. A burning torch lay on the ground near the first man whom the mule had thrown, by the light of which Don Quixote perceived him, and coming up to him he presented the point of the lance to his face, calling on him to yield himself prisoner, or else he would kill him, to which the prostrate man replied, I am prisoner enough as it is, I cannot stir, for one of my legs is broken, I entreat you, if you be a Christian gentleman, not to kill me, which will be committing grave sacrilege, for I am a licentiate and I hold first orders. Then what the devil brought you here, being a churchman, said Don Quixote. What, senor? said the other. My bad luck. Don Quixote. Ch Chapter 19, 138. Then still worse awaits you, said Don Quixote, if you do not satisfy me as to all I asked you at first. You, you shall be soon satisfied, said the licentiate. You must know, then, that though just now I said I was a licentiate, I am only a bachelor, and my name is Alonso Lopez, I am a native of Alcabendas, I come from the city of Beza with eleven others, priests, the same who fled with the torches, and we are going to the city of Segovia accompanying a dead body which is in that litter, and is that of a gentleman who died in Beza, where he was interred, and now, as I said, we are taking his bones to their burial minus place, which is in Segovia, where he was born. And who killed him? asked Don Quixote. God, by means of a malignant fever that took him, answered the bachelor. In that case, said Don Quixote, the Lord has relieved me of the task of avenging his death had any other slain him, but he who slew him having slain him, there is nothing for it but to be silent and shrug one's shoulders, I should do the same were he to slay myself and I would have your reverence know that I am a knight of La Mancha, Don Quixote by name, and it is my business in calling to roam the world righting wrongs and redressing injuries. I do not know how that about righting wrongs can be, said the bachelor, for from straight you have made me crooked, leaving me with a broken leg that will never see itself straight again all the days of its life, and the injury you have redressed in my case has been to leave me injured in such a way that I shall remain injured forever 
and the height of misadventure it was to fall in with you who go in search of adventures. Things do not all happen in the same way, answered Don Quixote. It all came, Sir Bachelor Alonso Lopez, of your going, as you did, by night, dressed in those surplices, with lighted torches, praying, covered with mourning, so that naturally you looked like something evil and of the other world, and so I could not avoid doing my duty in attacking you, and I should have attacked you even had I known positively that you were the very devils of hell, for such I certainly believed and took you to be. As my fate is so willed it, said the bachelor, I entreat you, Sir Knight Minus Errant, whose errand has been such an evil one for me, to help me to get from under this mule that holds one of my legs caught between the stirrup and the saddle. I would have talked until to Minus Morrow, said Don Quixote. How long were you going to wait before telling me of your distress? He at once called to Sancho, who however, had no mind to come, as he was just then engaged in unloading a sumter mule, well laden with provender, which these worthy. Don Quixote Chapter 19139 Gentlemen had brought with them. Sancho made a bag of his coat, and, getting together as much as he could, and as the bag would hold, he loaded his beast, and then hastened to obey his master's call, and helped him to remove the bachelor from under the mule. Then putting him on her back he gave him the torch, and Don Quixote bade him follow the track of his companions, and beg pardon of them on his part for the wrong which he could not help doing them. And said Sancho, if by chance these gentlemen should want to know who was the hero that served them so, your worship may tell them that he is the famous Don Quixote of La Mancha, otherwise called the Knight of the Rueful Countenance. The bachelor then took his departure. I forgot to mention that before he did so he said to Don Quixote, Remember that you stand excommunicated for having laid violent hands on a holy thing, juxta illid, s icas, swat and diabolo. I do not understand that Latin, answered Don Quixote, but I know while I did not lay hands, only this pike. Besides, I did not think I was committing an assault upon priests or things of the church, which, like a Catholic and faithful Christian as I am, I respect and revere, but upon phantoms and specters of the other world. But even so, I remember how it fared with Sid Ruy Diaz when he broke the chair of the ambassador of that king before his holiness the Pope, who excommunicated him. For the same, and yet the good Roderick of Vivar bore himself that day like a very noble and valiant knight. On hearing this the bachelor took his departure, as has been said, without making any reply, and Don Quixote asked Sancho what had induced him to call him the Knight of the Rueful Countenance more then than at any other time. I will tell you, answered Sancho, it was because I have been looking at you for some time by the light of the torch held by that unfortunate, and verily your worship has got of late the most ill minus favored countenance I ever saw, it must be either owing to the fatigue of this combat, or else to the want of teeth and grinders. It is not that, replied Don Quixote, but because the sage whose duty it will be to write the history of my achievements must have thought it proper that I should take some distinctive name as all knights of your did, one being he of the burning sword, another he of the unicorn, this one he of the damsels, that he of the phoenix, another the knight of the griffin, and another he of the death. And by these names and designations they were known all the world round, and so I say that the sage aforesaid must have put it into your mouth and mine just now to call me the knight of the rueful countenance, as I intend to call myself from this day forward, and that the said name may fit me better, I mean, when the opportunity offers, to have a very rueful countenance painted on my shield. Don Quixote Chapter 19140 There is no occasion, senor, for wasting time or money on making that countenance, said Sancho, for all that need be done is for your worship to show your own, face to face, to those who look at you, and without anything more, either image or shield, they will call you him of the rueful countenance and believe me I am telling you the truth, for I assure you, senor, and in good part be it said, hunger and the loss of your grinders have given you such an ill minus favored face that, as I 
Say, the rueful picture may be very well spared. Don Quixote laughed at Sancho's pleasantry. Nevertheless he resolved to call himself by that name and have his shield or buckler painted as he had devised. Don Quixote would have looked to see whether the body in the litter were bones or not, but Sancho would not have it, saying. Senor, you have ended this perilous adventure more safely for yourself than any of those I have seen. Perhaps these people, though beaten and routed, may bethink themselves that it is a single man that has beaten them, and feeling sore and ashamed of it may take heart and come in search of us and give us trouble enough. The ass is in proper trim, the mountains are near at hand, hunger presses, we have nothing more to do, but make good our retreat, and, as the saying is, the dead to the grave and the living to the loaf. Driving his ass before him he begged his master to follow, who, feeling that Sancho was right, did so without replying, and after proceeding some little distance between two hills they found themselves in a wide and retired valley, where they alighted, and Sancho unloaded his beast, and stretched upon the green grass, with hunger for sauce, they breakfasted, dined, lunched, and supped all at once, satisfying their appetites with more than one store of cold meat which the dead man's. Clerical gentlemen, who seldom put themselves on short allowance, had brought with them on their sumter mule. But another piece of ill minus luck befell them, which Sancho held the worst of all, and that was that they had no wine to drink, nor even water to moisten their lips, and as thirst tormented them, Sancho, observing that the meadow where they were was full of green and tender grass, said what will be told in the following chapter. Don Quixote Chapter 1941 Chapter 20 of the unexampled and unheard minus of adventure which was achieved by the valiant Don Quixote of L.A. Mancha with less peril than any ever achieved by any famous knight in the world. It cannot be, senor, but that this grass is a proof that there must be hard by some spring or brook to give it moisture so it would be well to move a little farther on, that we may find some place where we may quench this terrible thirst that plagues us, which beyond a doubt is more distressing than hunger. The advice seemed good to Don Quixote, and, he leading Rocinante by the bridle and Sancho the ass by the halter, after he had packed away upon him the remains of the supper, they advanced the meadow feeling their way, for the darkness of the night made it impossible to see anything, but they had not gone two hundred paces when a loud noise of water, as if falling from great rocks, struck their ears. The sound cheered them greatly, but halting to make out by listening from what quarter it came they heard unseasonably another noise which spoiled the satisfaction the sound of the water gave them, especially for Sancho, who was by nature timid and faint minus hearted. They heard, I say, strokes falling with a measured beat, and a certain rattling of iron and chains that, together with the furious din of the water, would have struck terror into any heart but Don Quixote's. The night was, as has been said, dark, and they had happened to reach a spot in among some tall trees, whose leaves stirred by a gentle breeze made a low ominous sound, so that, what with the solitude, the place, the darkness, the noise of the water, and the rustling of the leaves, everything inspired awe and dread, more especially as they perceived that the strokes did not cease, nor the wind lull, nor morning approach, to all which might be added their ignorance as to where they were. But Don Quixote, supported by his intrepid heart, leaped on Rocinante, and bracing his buckler on his arm, brought his pike to the slope, and said, Friend Sancho, know that I by heavens will have been born in this our iron age to revive revive and at the age of gold or the golden as it is called, I am he for whom perils, mighty achievements, and valiant deeds are reserved, I am, I say again, he who is to revive the knights of the round table, the twelve of France, and the nine worthies. And he who is to consign to oblivion the platters, the tablantes, the olivants and tirantes, the phoebuses and bilianuses, with the whole herd of famous knights minus errant of days gone by, performing in these in which I live.
Such exploits, marvels, and feats of arms as shall obscure their brightest deeds. Thou dost mark well, faithful and trusty squire, the gloom of this night, its strange silence, the dull confused murmur of those trees, the awful sound of that water in quest of which we came, that seems as though it were precipitating and dashing itself down from the lofty mountains of the moon, and that incessant hammering that wounds and pains our ears, which things all. Don Quixote Chapter 2142 Together in each of itself are enough to instill fear, dread, and dismay into the breast of Mars himself, much more into one not used to hazards and adventures of the kind. Well then, all this that I put before thee is but an incentive and stimulant to my spirit, making my heart burst in my bosom through eagerness to engage in this adventure, arduous as it promises to be, therefore tighten Rocinante's girths a little, and God be with thee, wait for me here three days and no more, and if in that time I come not back, Thou canst return to our village, and thence, to do me a favor and a service, thou wilt go to El Toboso, where thou shalt say to my incomparable Lady Dulcinea that her captive knight hath died in attempting things that might make him worthy of being called hers. When Sancho heard his master's words he began to weep in the most pathetic way, saying, Senor, I know not why your worship wants to attempt this so dreadful adventure, it is night now, no one sees us here, we can easily turn about and take ourselves out of danger, even if we don't drink for three days to come, and as there is no one to see us, all the less will there be anyone to set us down as cowards, besides, I have many a time heard the curate of our village, whom your worship knows well, preach that he who seeks danger perishes in it, so it is not right to tempt God by. Trying so tremendous a feat from which there can be no escape save by a miracle, and heaven has performed enough of them for your worship in delivering you from being blanketed as I was, and bringing you out victorious and safe and sound from among all those enemies that were with the dead man, and if all this does not move or soften that hard heart, let this thought and reflection move it, that you will have. Hardly quitted this spot when from pure fear I shall yield my soul up to anyone that will take. I left home and wife and children to come and serve your worship, trusting to do better and not worse, but as covetousness bursts the bag, it has rent my hopes asunder, for just as I had them highest about getting that wretched unlucky island your worship has so often promised me, I see that instead, and in lieu of it you mean to desert me now in a place so far from human reach, for God's sake, master mine, deal not so unjustly by me, and if your worship will not entirely give up attempting this feat, at least put it off till morning for by what the lore I learned when I was a shepherd tells me it cannot want three hours of dawn now, because the mouth of the horn is overhead and makes midnight in the line of the left arm. How canst thou see, Sancho, said Don Quixote, where it makes that line, or where this mouth or this occiput is that thou talkest of, when the night is so dark that there is not a star to be seen in the whole heaven? That's true, said Sancho, but fear has sharp eyes and sees things underground, much more above in heavens, besides, there is good reason to show that it now wants but little of day. Don Quixote Chapter 2143 Let, Let it want what it may, replied Don Quixote. It shall not be said of me now or at any time that tears or entreaties turn me aside from doing what was in accordance with knightly usage, and so I beg of thee, Sancho, to hold thy peace, for God, who has put it into my heart to undertake now this so unexampled and terrible adventure, will take care to watch over my safety and console thy sorrow. What thou hast to do is to tighten Rocinante's girths well, and wait here, for I shall come back shortly, alive or dead. Sancho perceiving it his master's final resolve, and how little his tears, counsels, and entreaties prevailed with him, determined to have recourse to his own ingenuity and compel him, if he could, to wait till daylight, 
And so, while tightening the girths of the horse, he quietly, and without being felt, with his ass halter tied both Rocinante's legs, so that when Don Quixote strove to go he was unable as the horse could only move by jumps. Seeing the success of his trick, Sancho Panza said, See there, senor. Heaven, moved by my tears and prayers, has so ordered it that Rocinante cannot stir, and if you will be obstinate, and spur and strike him, you will only provoke fortune and kick, as they say, against the pricks. Don Quixote at this grew desperate, but the more he drove his heels into the horse, the less he stirred him, and not having any suspicion of the time, he was fain to resign himself and wait till daybreak, or until Rocinante could move, firmly persuaded that all this came of something other than Sancho's ingenuity. So he said to him, As it is so, Sancho, and as Rocinante cannot move, I am content to wait till dawn smiles upon us, even though I weep while it delays its coming. There, there is no need to weep, answered Sancho, for I will amuse your worship by telling stories from this till daylight, unless indeed you like to dismount and lie down to sleep a little on the green grass after the fashion of knights minus errant, so as to be fresher when day comes and the moment arrives for attempting this extraordinary adventure you are looking forward to. What art thou talking about dismounting or sleeping for? said Don Quixote. Am I, thinkest thou, one of those knights that take their rest in the presence of danger? Sleep thou who art born to sleep or do as thou wilt, for I will act as I think most consistent with my character. Be not angry, master mine, replied Sancho, I did not mean to say that, and coming close to him he laid one hand on the pommel of the saddle, and the other on the cantle so that he held his master's left thigh in his embrace, not daring to separate a finger's width from him, so much afraid was he of the strokes which still resounded with a regular beat. Don Quixote bade him tell some story to amuse him as he had proposed, to which Sancho replied that he would if his dread of what he heard would let him, still, said he, I will strive to tell a story which, if I can manage to relate it, and nobody interferes with the telling, is the Don Quixote Chapter 2144 Best, Best of stories, and let your worship give me your attention, for here I begin. What was, was, and may the good that is to come be for all, and the evil for him who goes to look for it minus your worship must know that the beginning the old folk used to put to their tales was not just as each one pleased. It was a maxim of Cato Zanzarino the Roman, that says the evil for him that goes to look for it, and it comes as pat to the purpose now as ring to finger, to show that your worship should keep quiet and not go looking for evil in any quarter, and that we should go back. By some other road, since nobody forces us to follow this in which so many terrors affright us. Go on with thy story, Sancho, said Don Quixote, and leave the choice of our road to my care. I say then, continued Sancho, that in a village of Estremadura there was a goat minus shepherd minus that is to say, one who tended goats minus which shepherd or goat herd, as my story goes, was called Lope Ruiz, and this Lope Ruiz was in love with a shepherdess called Teralva, which shepherdess called Teralva was the daughter of a rich grazier, and this rich grazier minus. If that is the way thou tellest thy tale, Sancho, said Don Quixote, repeating twice all thou hast to say, Thou wilt not have done these two days, go straight on with it, and tell it like a reasonable man, or else say nothing. Tales are always told in my country in the very way I am telling this, answered Sancho, and I cannot tell it in any other, nor is it right of your worship to ask me to make new customs. Tell it as thou wilt, replied Don Quixote, and as fate will have it that I cannot help listening to thee, go on. And so, lord of my soul, continued Sancho, as I have said, this shepherd was in love with Teralva the shepherdess, who was a wild buxom lass with something of the look of a man about her, for she had little mustaches, I fancy I see her now. Then you knew her, said Don Quixote. I did not. I did not know her. 
Sir, said Sancho, but he who told me the story said it was so true and certain that when I told it to another I might safely declare and swear I had seen it all myself. And so in course of time, the devil, who never sleeps and puts everything in confusion, contrived that the love the shepherd bore the shepherd is turned into hatred, and ill minus will, and the reason, according to evil tongues, was some little jealousy she caused him that crossed the line and trespassed on forbidden ground, and so much did the shepherd hate her from that time forward that, in order to escape from her, he determined to quit the country and go where he should never set eyes on her. Again. Teralva, when she found herself spurned by. Don Quixote. Chapter 2145 Lope was immediately smitten with love for him, though she had never loved him before. That is the natural way of women, said Don Quixote, to scorn the one that loves them, and love the one that hates them, go on, Sancho. came to pass, said Sancho, that the shepherd carried out his intention, and driving his goats before him took his way across the plains of Estremadura to pass over into the kingdom of Portugal. Teralva, who knew of it, went after him, and on foot and barefoot followed him at a distance, with a pilgrim's staff in her hand and a scrip round her neck, in which she carried, it is said, a bit of looking minus glass and a piece of a comb and some little pot or other of paint for her face, but let her carry what she did, I am not going to trouble myself to prove it, all I say is, that the shepherd, they say, came with his flock to cross over the river Guadiana, which was at that time swollen, and almost overflowing its banks, and at the spot he came to there was neither ferry nor boat nor anyone to carry him, or his flock to the other side, at which he was much vexed, for he perceived that Teralva was approaching and would give him great annoyance with her tears and entreaties, however, he went looking about so closely that he discovered a fisherman who had alongside of him a boat so small that it could only hold one person and one goat but for all that he spoke to him, and agreed with him to carry himself and his three hundred goats across. The fisherman got into the boat and carried one goat over, he came back and carried another over, he came back again, and again brought over another minus let your worship keep count of the goats the fisherman is taking across, for if one escapes the memory there will be an end of the story, and it will be impossible to tell another word of it. To proceed, I must tell you the landing place on the other side was miry and slippery, and the fisherman lost a great deal of time in going and coming, Still he returned for another goat, and another, and another. Take it for granted he brought them all across, said Don Quixote, and don't keep going and coming in this way, or thou wilt not make an end of bringing them over this twelve-month. How many have gone across so far, said Sancho. How the devil do I know, replied Don Quixote. There it is, said Sancho, what I told you, that you must keep a good count. Well then, by God, there is an end of the story, for there is no going any farther. How can that be, said Don Quixote, is it so essential to the story to know to a nicety the goats that have crossed over, that if there be a mistake of one in the reckoning, thou canst not go on with it? No, senor, not a bit, replied Sancho, for when I asked your worship to tell me how many goats had crossed, and you answered you did not know, at that very instant all I had to. Don Quixote Chapter 2146 Say passed away out of my memory, and, faith, there was much virtue in it, and entertainment. So then, said Don Quixote, the story has come to an end. As much as my mother has, said Sancho. In truth, said Don Quixote, thou hast told one of the rarest stories, tales, or histories, that anyone in the world could have imagined, and such a way of telling it and ending it was never seen nor will be in a lifetime, though I expected nothing else from thy excellent understanding. But I do not wonder, for perhaps those ceaseless strokes may have confused thy wits. All that may be, replied Sancho, but I know that as to my story, all that can be said is that it ends there where the mistake in the count of the passage of the goats begins. Let it end where it will, well and good, said Don Quixote, and let us see if Rocinante can go, and again he spurred him, and again Rocinante made jumps and remained where he was, so well tied was he. Just then, whether it was the cold of the morning that was now approaching, or that he had eaten something laxative at supper, or that it was only natural, as is most likely, Sancho felt a desire to do what no one could do for him, but so great was the fear that had penetrated his heart, he dared not separate himself from his master by as much as the black of his nail, to escape doing what he wanted was however, also impossible, so what he did for peace's sake was to remove his right. 
hand which held the back of the saddle, and with it to untie gently and silently the running string which alone held up his breeches, so that on loosening it they at once fell down round his feet like fetters, he then raised his shirt as well as he could and bared his hind quarters, no slim ones. But this accomplished, which he fancied was all he had to do to get out of this terrible strait and embarrassment, another still greater. Difficulty presented itself, for it seemed to him impossible to relieve himself without making some noise, and he ground his teeth and squeezed his shoulders together, holding his breath as much as he could, but in spite of his precautions he was unlucky enough after all to make a little noise, very different from that which was causing him so much fear. Don Quixote, hearing it, said, What noise is that, Sancho? I don't know, senor, said he, it must be something new, for adventures and misadventures never begin with a trifle. Once more he tried his luck, and succeeded so well, that without any further noise or disturbance he found himself relieved of the burden that had given him so much discomfort. But as Don Quixote's sense of smell was as acute as his hearing, and as Sancho was so closely linked with him that the fumes rose almost in a straight line, it could not be, but that some should reach his nose, and as soon as they did he. Don Quixote Chapter 2147 Came to its relief by compressing it between his fingers, saying in a rather snuffing tone, Sancho, it strikes me thou art in great fear. I am, answered Sancho, but how does your worship perceive it now more than ever? Because just now thou smellest stronger than ever, and not of ambergris, answered Don Quixote. Very likely, said Sancho, but that's not my fault, but your worships, for leading me about at unseasonable hours, and at such unwanted paces. Then go back three or four, my friend, said Don Quixote all the time with his fingers to his nose, and for the future pay more attention to thy person, and to what thou owest to mine, for it is my great familiarity with thee that has bred this contempt. I'll bet, replied Sancho, that your worship thinks I have done something I ought not with my person. It makes it worse to stir it, friend Sancho, returned Don Quixote. With this and other talk of the same sort master and man passed the night, till Sancho, perceiving that daybreak was coming on apace, very cautiously untied Rocinante and tied up his breeches. As soon as Rocinante found himself free, though by nature he was not at all meddlesome, he seemed to feel lively and began pawing minus for as to capering, begging his pardon, he knew not what it meant. Don Quixote then, observing that Rocinante could move, took it as a good sign and a signal that he should attempt the dread adventure. By this time day had fully broken and everything showed distinctly, and Don Quixote saw that he was among some tall trees, chestnuts, which cast a very deep shade, he perceived likewise that the sound of the strokes did not cease, but could not discover what caused it, and so without any further delay he let Rocinante feel the spur, and once more taking leave of Sancho, he told him to wait for him there three days at most, as he had said before, and if he should not have returned by that time, he might feel sure it had been God's will that he should end his days in that perilous adventure. He again repeated the message and commission with which he was to go on his behalf to his lady Dulcinea, and said he was not to be uneasy as to the payment of his services, for before leaving home he had made his will, in which he would find himself fully recompensed in the matter of wages in due proportion to the time he had served, but if God delivered him safe, sound, and unheard out of that danger, he might look upon the promised island as much more than certain. Sancho began to weep afresh on again hearing the affecting words of his good master, and resolved to stay with him until the final issue and end of the business. From these tears and this honorable resolve of Sancho Panz as the author of this history infers that he must have been of good birth, and at least an old Christian, and the feeling he displayed touched us, but not so much. Don Quixote Chapter 2148 As to make him show any weakness, on the contrary, hiding what he felt as well as he could, he began to move towards that quarter whence the sound of the water and of the strokes seemed to come. Sancho followed him on foot, leading by the halter, as his custom was, his ass, his constant comrade in prosperity or adversity, and advancing some distance through the shady chestnut trees they came upon a little meadow at the foot of some high rocks, down which a mighty rush of water flung itself. At the foot of the rocks were some rudely constructed houses looking more like ruins than houses, from among which came, they perceived, the din and clatter of blows, which still continued without intermission. Rocinante took fright at the noise of the water and of the blows, but quieting him Don Quixote advanced step by step towards the houses, commending himself with all his heart to his lady, imploring her support in that dread pass and enterprise, and on the way commending himself to God too, not to forget him. 
Sancho, who never quitted his side, stretched his neck as far as he could and peered between the legs of Rocinante to see if he could now discover what it was that caused him such fear and apprehension. They went it might be a hundred paces farther, when on turning a corner the true cause, beyond the possibility of any mistake, of that dread minus sounding and to them all minus inspiring noise that had kept them all the night in such fear and perplexity, appeared plain and obvious, and it was, if, reader, thou art not disgusted and disappointed, six fulling hammers which by their alternate strokes made all the din. When Don Quixote perceived what it was, he was struck dumb and rigid from head to foot. Sancho glanced at him and saw him with his head bent down upon his breast in manifest mortification, and Don Quixote glanced at Sancho and saw him with his cheeks puffed out and his mouth full of laughter and evidently ready to explode with it, and in spite of his vexation he could not help laughing at the sight of him, and when Sancho saw his master begin he let go so heartily that he had to hold his sides with both hands to keep himself from bursting with laughter. For times he stopped, and as many times did his laughter break out afresh with the same violence as at first, whereat Don Quixote grew furious, above all when he heard him say mockingly, Thou must know, friend Sancho, that of heavens will I was born in this our iron age to revive and at the golden or age of gold, I am he for whom are reserved perils, mighty achievements, valiant deeds, and here he went on. Repeating the words that Don Quixote uttered the first time they heard the awful strokes. Don Quixote then, seeing that Sancho was turning him into ridicule, was so mortified and vexed that he lifted up his pike and smote him two such blows that if, instead of catching them on his shoulders, he had caught them on his head there would have been no wages to pay, unless indeed to his heirs. Sancho seeing that he was getting an awkward return in earnest for his jest, and fearing his master might carry it still further, said to him very humbly, Calm yourself, sir, for by God I am only joking. Well then, if you are joking I am not, replied Don Quixote. Look here, my lively gentleman, if these, instead of being fulling hammers, had been some perilous adventure. Don Quixote Chapter 2149 Have I not, think you, shown the courage required for the attempt and achievement? Am I, perchance, being as I am, a gentleman, bound to know and distinguish sounds and tell whether they come from fulling mills or not, and that, when perhaps, as is the case, I have never in my life seen any as you have, low bore as you are, that have been born and bred among them. But turn me these six hammers into six giants and bring them to beard me, one by one or all together, and if I do not knock them head over heels, then make what mockery you like of me. No more of that, senor, returned Sancho, I own I went a little too far with the joke. But tell me, your worship, now that peace is made between us, and may God bring you out of all the adventures that may befall you as safe and sound as he has brought you out of this one, was it not a thing to laugh at, and is it not a good story, the great fear we were in, minus at least that I was in, for as to your worship I see now that you neither know nor understand what either fear or dismay is. I do not deny, said Don Quixote, that what happened to us may be worth laughing at, but it is not worth making a story about, for it is not everyone that is shrewd enough to hit the right point of a thing. At any rate, said Sancho, your worship knew how to hit the right point with your pike, aiming at my head and hitting me on the shoulders, thanks be to God and my own smartness in dodging it. But let that pass, all will come out in the scouring, for I have heard say he loves thee well that makes thee weep, and moreover that it is the way with great lords after any hard words they give a servant to give him a pair of breeches, though I do not know what they give after blows, unless it be that knights minus errant after blows give islands, or kingdoms on the mainland. It may be on the dice, said Don Quixote, that all thou sayest will come true. Overlook the past, for thou art shrewd enough to know that our first movements are not in our own control, and one thing for the future bear in mind, that thou curb and restrain thy loquacity in my company, for in all the books of chivalry that I have read, and they are innumerable, I never met with a squire who talked so much to his lord as thou dost to thine, and in fact I feel it to be a great fault of thine and of mine, of thine, that thou hast so little respect for me of mine, that I do not make myself more respected. There was Gandolin, the squire of Amatis of Gaul, that was count of the Insula Firme, and we read of him that he always addressed his lord with his cap in his hand, his head bowed down, and his body bent double, more Turquesco. And then, what shall we say of Gisabel, the squire of Galar, who was so silent that in order to indicate to us the greatness of his marvelous taciturnity his name is only once mentioned in the whole of that history, as long as it is truthful? From all I have said thou wilt gather, Sancho, that there must be a difference between master and man, between lord and lackey, between knight and squire, 
so that from this day forward in our intercourse we must observe more respect and take less liberties, for in whatever way I may be provoked with you it will be bad for the pitcher. The favors and benefits that I have. Don Quixote Chapter 2150 Promised you will come in due time, and if they do not your wages at least will not be lost, as I have already told you. All that your worship says is very well, said Sancho, but I should like to know, in case the time of favors should not come, and it might be necessary to fall back upon wages, how much did the squire of a knight minus errant get in those days, and did they agree by the month, or by the day like bricklayers? I do not believe, replied Don Quixote, that such squires were ever on wages, but were dependent on favor, and if I have now mentioned thine in the sealed will I have left at home, it was with a view to what may happen, for as yet I know not how chivalry will turn out in these wretched times of ours, and I do not wish my soul to suffer for trifles in the other world, for I would have thee know, Sancho, that in this there is no condition more hazardous than that of adventurers. That is true, said Sancho, since the mere noise of the hammers of a fulling mill can disturb and disquiet the heart of such a valiant errant adventurer as your worship, but you may be sure I will not open my lips henceforward to make light of anything of your worships, but only to honor you as my master and natural lord. By so doing, replied Don Quixote, shalt thou live long on the face of the earth, for next to parents, masters are to be respected as though they were parents. Don Quixote Chapter 2151 Chapter 21 W. Hitch treats of the exalted adventure and rich prize of Mambrino's helmet, together with other things that happened to our invincible knight. It now began to rain a little, and Sancho was for going into the fulling mills, but Don Quixote had taken such an abhorrence to them on account of the late joke that he would not enter them on any account, so turning aside to right they came upon another road, different from that which they had taken the night before. Shortly afterwards Don Quixote perceived a man on horseback who wore on his head something that shone like gold, and the moment he saw him he turned to Sancho and said. I think, Sancho, there is no proverb that is not true, all being maxims drawn from experience itself, the mother of all the sciences, especially that one that says, where one door shuts another opens. I say so because if last night fortune shut the door of the adventure we were looking for against us, cheating us with the fulling mills, it now opens wide another one for another better and more certain adventure, and if I do not contrive to enter it, it will be my own fault, and I cannot lay it to my ignorance of fulling mills, or the darkness of the night. I say this because, if I mistake not, there comes towards us one who wears on his head the helmet of Mambrino, concerning which I took the oath thou rememberest. Mind what you say, your worship, and still more what you do, said Sancho, for I don't want any more fulling mills to finish off fulling and knocking our senses out. The devil take thee, man, said Don Quixote, what has a helmet to do with fulling mills? I don't know, replied Sancho, but faith, if I might speak as I used, perhaps I could give such reasons that your worship would see you were mistaken in what you say. How can I be mistaken in what I say, unbelieving traitor, returned Don Quixote. Tell me, sayest thou not yonder knight coming towards us on a dappled grey steed, who has upon his head a helmet of gold? What I see and make out, answered Sancho is only a man on a grey ass like my own, who has something that shines on his head. Well, that is the helmet of Mambrino, said Don Quixote, stand to one side and leave. Don Quixote Chapter 21-152 Me alone with him, thou shalt see how, without saying a word, to save time, I shall bring this adventure to an issue and possess myself of the helmet I have so longed for. I will take care to stand aside, said Sancho, but God grant, I say once more, that it may be marjoram and not fulling mills. I have told thee, brother, on no account to mention those fulling mills to me again, said Don Quixote, or I vow minus and I say no more minus I'll full the soul out of you. Sancho held his peace in dread lest his master should carry out the vow he had hurled like a bull at him. The fact of the matter as regards the helmet, steed, and knight that Don Quixote saw was this. In that neighborhood there were two villages, one of them so small that it had neither apothecary's shop nor barber, which the other that was close to it had, so the barber of the larger served the smaller, and in it there was a sick man who required to be bled and another man who wanted to be shaved, and on this errand the barber was going, carrying with him a brass basin, but as luck would have it, as he was on the way it began to rain, and not to spoil his hat, which probably was anew. One, he put the basin on his head, and being clean it glittered at half a league's distance. He rode upon a grey ass, as Sancho said, 
and this was what made it seem to Don Quixote to be a dapple minus gray steed, and a knight, and a golden helmet, for everything he saw he made to fall in with his crazy chivalry, and oh minus errant. Notions, and when he saw the poor knight draw near, without entering into any parley with him, at Rocinante's top speed he bore down upon him with the pike pointed low, fully determined to run him through and through, and as he reached him, without checking the fury of his charge, he cried to him. Defend thyself, miserable being, or yield me of thine own accord that which is so reasonably my due. The barber, who without any expectation or apprehension of it saw this apparition coming down upon him, had no other way of saving himself from the stroke of the lance, but to let himself fall off his ass, and no sooner had he touched the ground than he sprang up more nimbly than a deer and sped away across the plain faster than the wind. He left the basin on the ground, with which Don Quixote contented himself, saying that the pagan had shown his discretion and imitated the beaver, which finding itself pressed by the hunter's bites and cuts off with its teeth that for which, by its natural instinct, it knows it is pursued. He told Sancho to pick up the helmet, and he taking it in his hands said, Don Quixote Chapter 21 153 By God the basin is a good one, and worth a reel of eight if it is worth a maravedis, and handed it to his master, who immediately put it on his head, turning it round, now this way, now that, in search of fitment, and not finding it he said, clearly the pagan to whose measure this famous head minus piece was first forged must have had a very large head, but the worst of it is half of it is wanting. When Sancho heard him call the basin a headpiece he was unable to restrain his laughter, but remembering his master's wrath he checked himself in the midst of it. What art thou laughing at, Sancho, said Don Quixote. I am laughing, said he, to think of the great head the pagan must have had who owned this helmet, for it looks exactly like a regular barber's basin. Dost thou know what I suspect, Sancho, said Don Quixote that this wonderful piece of this enchanted helmet must by some strange accident have come into the hands of someone who was unable to recognize or realize its value, and who, not knowing what he did, and seeing it to be of the purest gold, must have melted down one half for the sake of what it might be worth, and of the other made this which is like a barber's basin as thou sayest, but be it as it may, to me who recognize it. Its transformation makes no difference, for I will set it to rights at the first village where there is a blacksmith, and in such style that that helmet the god of smithies forged for the god of battles shall not surpass it, or even come up to it, and in the meantime, I will wear it as well as I can, for something is better than nothing, all the more as it will be quite enough to protect me from any chance blow of a stone. That, that is, said Sancho, if it is not shot with a sling as they were in the battle of the two armies, when they signed the cross on your worship's grinders and smashed the flask with that blessed draft that made me vomit my bowels up. It does not grieve me much to have lost it, said Don Quixote, for thou knowest, Sancho, that I have the receipt in my memory. So have I, answered Sancho, but if ever I make it, or try it again as long as I live, may this be my last hour, moreover, I have no intention of putting myself in the way of wanting it, for I mean, with all my five senses, to keep myself from being wounded or from wounding anyone, as to being blanketed again I say nothing, for it is hard to prevent mishaps of that sort. And if they come there is nothing for it, but to squeeze our shoulders together, hold our breath, shut our eyes, and let ourselves go where luck and the blanket may send us. Thou art a bad Christian, Sancho, said Don Quixote on hearing this, for once an injury has been done thee thou never forgettest it, but know that it is the part of noble end. Don Quixote Chapter 21 154 Generous hearts not to attach importance to trifles. What lame leg hast thou got by it, what broken rib, what cracked head, that thou canst not forget that jest? For jest and sport it was, properly regarded, and had I not seen it in that light I would have returned and done more mischief in revenging thee than the Greeks did for the rape of Helen who, if she were alive now, or if my Dulcinea had lived then, might depend upon it she would not be so famous for her beauty as she is, and here he heaved a sigh and sent it aloft, and said Sancho, let it pass for a jest as it cannot be revenged in earnest, but I know what sort of jest in earnest it was, and I know it will never be rubbed out of my memory any more than off my shoulders. But putting that aside, will your worship tell me what are we to do with this dapple minus gray steed that looks like a gray ass, which that Martino that your worship overthrew has left? Deserted here? For, from the way he took to his heels and bolted, he is not likely ever to. Come back for it, and buy my beard but the gray is a good one. I have never been in the habit, said Don Quixote, of taking spoil of those whom I vanquish, nor is it